<sighs> Normally, I would give up at the second time of this recording, but consider it your all your lucky day, because lucky for you guys, I'm a night owl, and it's like 1.30 in the, at, in the night, in the morning. Well, technically, it's 1.27, but still, it's getting to the early. So anyway, let's do this. Hello, everybody. This is Dunkle Dylan here, God of Chaos. You already know what I do. You already know who I am, and you already know what I am capable of. So I'm going to pull a Last of Us. I'm bored. You're bored. Let's get this over with. As we both know what we do, we both know what we were capable of, but we both know what the hell is what. But luckily for you all, this is one of those moments. So... Oh... Let's do this! So, yeah, today we are doing a what if that has been requested over the past three or four five months right now a lot of people have been requesting a dead by daylight what if so here you go oh what if deku was in dead by daylight for those who do not know what day dead by daylight is it's a video game about mostly a um serial killers and survivors so think like um uh, what's the best way of saying it? Like, um, think one of those video games you would play when you survive. Think like Slenderman or Friday the 13th, the video game. Yes, there's a video game about it. it um, what else? Let me think. Uh, I know there's another one. Uh, uh I don't actually remember the rest. But you get where I'm going. Now, anyway, with Midoriya, well, actually not with Midoriya, I better not get too into it, but before we could, I am going to do a certain person. I can't say his name because I just don't know how. His name is extremely weird to say, but here's the best way I will spell it. A-Z-H-Y-M-O-V-S. That's who he is. And he made this video a year ago, so shout out to him. I hope I spelled your name right. If I didn't say it out loud, it's because I don't know how to say it. It is, well, weird. And this is a a lore about the guy. Right, so, yeah, here's the best thing you can do. Just listen. So, here you go. Hopefully there's no ads. You really can't get much for five bucks. Motherfucker. As soon as I said it, too. Have fun. I'm going to play a video game. Evan, son of wealthy and renowned business owner Archie McMillan, was born on the grounds of his father's vast estate that held their family name, McMillan. The estate was situated in a town named Weeks, a short way from the larger Weatherfield and the even larger Seattle, Washington. The McMillan estate was a great hunk of land which contained a coal tower, a large storehouse, an ironworks, a mine, and a sprawling wood. The McMillans had gained their fortune from coal mining, the coal they used to ignite the fires of their ironworks, another source of income. It had drawn the jealous and envious eyes of the most pampered families of weeks, and had caused Archie to have a harsh outer shell. As a child, Evan is sensitive, kind, and creative, just like his mother, who is the complete opposite of his father. She has blonde hair, blue eyes, and a soft voice. Part of the vast estate and its running comes down to his father's workers, all of which are ruled with an iron fist. In order to keep them in line, Archie would strike them with brass knuckles and call them maggots. During this time, Archie's brother, Evan's uncle, is assisting in the running of the estate, trying to stop Archie's mistreatment and sort out some better wages for their workers. Whilst Evan is still young, his uncle is killed whilst out on a hunting trip with his father out in the estate woods by a bear. Later, shortly before her death, Evan's mother encourages him to continue with his sketching. One day, according to his father, she is said to have been swept away by a powerful current in a nearby stream, which she went to swim in. The death of Evan's mother greatly impacts him. He takes after her in many ways, developing his artistic side, something that his father is not a fan of. Once his mother is dead, Archie begins to take Evan out on hunting trips through the estate woods in attempts to make him a better man. He would say that drawing was for weaklings, and he wasn't going to have a weak son. Every time they would go together, his father would always tell the same story, the story about himself and his brother. 
and the hunting trip that killed him. He described the bear. He described it attacking his uncle, ripping his arm clean off before it bit down and took off his head. His father says he tried to save him. He says he drew a knife and killed the bear before tearing it open and searching its entrails, pulling out his uncle's severed head, finally claiming that he carried both the head and the body a full five miles back to the estate so he could be buried. Right. When Evan is 13, his father breaks his jaw, leaving him unable to eat properly and forced to sip everything through a straw, and all because he showed weakness. Evan reaches the age of 14. Although his father teaches him harsh lessons and tries to convince him to treat the workers for what they are, maggots, he begins to make friends with many of them. Some are fearful of him, but others see that he could be useful. Throughout the years, Evan has become a talented artist. He shows his drawings to the workers and they tell him how good he is. They find the art comforting in the midst of the dark cold and iron mine. It makes them trust Evan. Maybe all the Macmillans aren't so bad, they begin to think. After Evan befriends a few of them, they decide to tell him a secret. They tell him of the workers' union and the plans for an uprising. They'd become sick of the mistreatment. They'd become sick of Archie McMillan. Time and time again, workers would go missing. Widows would appear and ask what had happened to their husbands. Mothers looking for their sons. All the workers wanted was to be with their families. They convince Evan to keep their secret, to keep it so they can one day have their freedom once more. Evan does as they say, determined to protect his new friends. The planned union strike gives us an idea of when this was all likely taking place. In Seattle, there was a union strike in the February of 1919, called the Seattle General Strike. It was a five-day work stoppage aimed to demand higher wages as many workers would be in poor conditions and working upwards of 12 hours a day. As Evan keeps the secret, his father grows suspicious. His father grows angry, throwing him to the ground. Evan has learnt now not to cry, to not show any weakness. He thinks back to when he was struck a year earlier. The thought of sipping through a straw doesn't sit well with him. He wonders who he should remain loyal to. Should it be his friends? Bob, Tim, Jim, or his father. For now, he decides to remain defiant and to help his new friends, but his father can still sense the weakness. This time, he drags Evan down to the mines, where he shows him how to treat the maggots, how to break them and their spirit. Evan begins to feel just like them, another maggot breaking under his father's grasp. His father shouts at a sickly man. Evan watches, only wishing he could do something to intervene. He still has his secret, though. The Union would soon be on their way. When they are broken, they are a tool to be wielded, his father tells him. Evan can't help but remember his mother, how his father must have broken her too. He was doing the same to Evan now. He was going to break him. He would just be another tool. Evan watches as he yells at the workers. The workers are sick. His friends are sick. And they can't leave. They need their jobs. It's like a prison. His father kicks a worker in the gut and tells Evan to drag him out of the mine. Evan has a brief realization. The man. He's weak. Evan is disgusted by it. He wants to put the maggot out of its misery. Evan and his father are out hunting again, and as he always does, he begins to tell the bear story as Evan sets a trap. Except this time saying he carried his brother's body ten miles. Wasn't it five before, Evan thinks? The story keeps changing. What if there never was a bear? Evan wonders. This thought inspires Evan, grows in his mind. He grabs his pen, furiously sketching out his father in a bear suit killing his uncle. Evan had never met his uncle though. He knew only that he was a philanthropist. Disloyal is how his father saw it. He would have run the business into the ground with all that silly stuff about proper wages. And despite it all, Evan was sure now that his father had killed his uncle. At that, he had killed him in a cowardly way. That night, Evan went outside and he grabbed a large rock. He creeped into his father's room and hung it over him, ready to let it drop down and crush his skull. But he couldn't help thinking his father had done so much for him. His father wanted to make him strong. Evan lowered the rock, and deciding he could do it another way. He could lure him out into the mine, ignite a stick of dynamite. The thought ran dry. He went back to his room. This time he sketched his mother, his father in a bear suit drowning her. And there was no way a current took her away. Both his uncle and mother had stood in his father's way, and he had gotten rid of both of them. What were his options though? Obedience or death? He was tired of obedience. One night, Evan's father stares at him across the dinner table. He knew something. A year earlier, Evan had almost beaten a man to death. The man had mentioned his mother. All his father had done was watch and laugh as he beat him. The authorities pulled Evan away. His father had smiled at him then, and he knew what he wouldn't admit to himself. He enjoyed beating that man. Both times, 
He had the same look in his eyes. Evan returns to his room to find his sketches torn to bits. He puts the pieces together, all of them accounted for except one. He doesn't have the picture of his drowning mother. His father enters his room. He reveals to him that he knew his secret. He knows about the union. A few of his maggot friends sold him out for a few dollars. I'm sorry, Evan says. His father says nothing. Evan follows him to his bedroom, where he sees a picture of his dying mother, framed above the bed. His father tells him he will learn a lesson tomorrow, one he hopes he understands. Evan stares at his father and feels hate. Hate for the maggots who betrayed him, and for his father, respect. No. Admiration. The Macmillan estate began to thrive, with father and son working side by side. Production was always high, and the maggots always in order. As the years went by though, and as Evan's father began to deteriorate in health, many of the rich townspeople of Weeks set their eyes to the estate, to get at Archie Macmillan, and to steal away the wealth he had. Evan would lash out at them, protect his father. His father would keep asking favors of him, and Evan would execute them without a second thought. One day in sickness, Archie snapped. He ordered Evan to deal with the maggots. Evan stepped down to the mines, onto the estate, and got over a hundred of his men to begin following him. Once down there, he strutted out, grabbed some dynamite and sealed the mines behind him, in an event now known to be one of the worst mass murders in human history, where hundreds of poor workers spent their last moments choking and coughing themselves to starvation in the cold confines of the Macmillan Estate Mine. It isn't clear what happened that day, nor the truth behind it. Some say it was Evan who led them down there, others his father. There is some hint from the archive cinematics of the possibility that Archie may have framed Evan. Although it is unclear whether this scene refers to the man he beat or the mining disaster, it seems more likely it was to do with beating the man. Confusion comes with the fact that in the cinematic, the mines also collapse. Anyway, the true number who died is still unknown. The bodies never recovered. Archie, however, was found. He was found in the basement of the storehouse, with shattered leg bones and a mining hammer which laid ominously on his lap. Someone had trapped him down there, locked in the basement of his own estate, sharing a similar fate to that of his workers. In the remains of his face, a crude smile had been cut into his flesh. Evan was never found. He had simply disappeared, leaving the estate to fall into disrepair. After the events at the mine around 30 years later in the summer of 1956, a man visits the town of Weeks by the name of Benedict Baker. Benedict is curious to discover what has happened within the town after discovering a total of 364 different missing persons reports, none of them solved, no bodies found. Although he had seen many towns with similar statistics before, he had never seen one with numbers this high, and the last missing persons report to have occurred had only been 10 weeks prior to his arrival. As Benedict explored the forgotten town with its derelict buildings and collapsed structures, he began to feel an unnerving presence amidst the decay, a horrid feeling which seemed to cling only to the town of Weeks. He decided to investigate further, moving on to a nearby town named Weatherfield. There he visited a library, deciding he had to learn more about the surrounding area. It was there in the library that he learned of a vast industrial estate that once thrived, but now as he had seen, it had fallen through a series of disasters. Benedict felt convinced of his original perception of weeks. It had been just what he was looking for, this corruption. He spent two days in the library and attempted to speak to the Weatherfield locals. All of them refused to talk of the rot coming from Weeks, turning away from him, their eyes wide with terror. Next, Benedict talks to the librarian, explaining what he had learned about the Macmillan estate deaths and how the rot began after they had occurred. She refuses, however, to speak or to help him telling him only of the teenagers who drift through to vandalize and search the ruined property, often on a dare, and often not returning. And so he digs further into the archives, until he finds some maps that show the way to the estate. Benedict looks them over, deciding he will go over to the Macmillan estate, the heart of the rot, and investigate for himself. Benedict never returned from his journey. The whereabouts of Evan were in fact unknown, and really as good as missing. Evan had gone to somewhere no one would ever find him, taken by a dark force known to no one, the Entity. It had taken Evan from the grounds of his father's estate, into its cause, into its world. It had given everything Evan had needed to continue killing, and a new name, the 
trapper. The trapper forged his weapons and clothing on the grounds of his father's estate, now enclosed in the realm of the entity, in a distorted reality, a large iron cleaver. His primary weapon, hammered by his own hands from the metals in the mine. Second, a foothold trap made of steel, a grotesque instrument meant for hunting bears would now be used for a wider purpose. He decided his rubber apron would remain, through it, hooks that dug deep into his flesh, and finally the mask, twisted and soulless, it aims to torment his prey, and forever show the pained grin of a man torn by loyalty and shame. From here he set out into the new realm, the entity whispering in his ear, he would not serve another master. But this, the trapper figured, was not a master he could so easily kill. Benedict awoke in a strange place, with no memory of how he had come to be there, only of leaving Weatherfield for the Macmillan estate. He soon discovered that the place he was now in was a corrupted mirror of what had once been, a dark reflection of the world, filled only with pain, regret, and a desire to devour all hope. It is theorized that Evan never wanted to kill or continually hunt down survivors. He may have even originally been taken as a survivor to begin with, and the hooks that puncture his flesh remaining as a reminder of his past time is one potentially. Could he have really got this way just through a harsh upbringing, or was the entity interfering all along? Regardless, whatever he had been once, he no longer was in this entity's realm. There is a vast monster of a man with a hideous grin torn across the mask that keeps stalking my every move. Similar to a hunter, he tracks us, priming devastating traps amongst the greenery. Extreme vigilance and a light step is essential in avoiding the blood-curdling clench of a bear trap of the clutches of what I've taken to calling the miserable, smiling killer. <clears throat> yep, that's, uh, that's the trapper. Y'all wanted this, and here you go. Now, pretty much, we're going to pull this stunt. So let's say in this one, due to the entity, owing me a solid, or a hundred, right? considering that the entity is just another version of me, just a little bit weaker. But the fancy way is the entity is mostly just uh, the opposite of what it should be. The entity is literally just one giant version of the the opposite of our world. Mostly where everything is the opposite. It, right now, it would be probably peace, lovely, non-racist type of shit. It sounds about reasonable, right? Hey, well, it's true. So anyway, with Midoriya, the Midoriya somehow managed to escape the Entity's grasp by going through the location that he's been in. So yeah. <clears throat> I had to stretch that one. Oh, fuck. Now the Entity has managed to actually like, get him out. But Midoriya managed to get out of there. And he sees the world of Japan. In this one, Izuku's American. And... <laughs> And everyone sees him thinking that he's wearing a Halloween costume. It doesn't take an expert to know this, but he also noticed that people now have powers. So, mostly in this one, he was quirkless, obviously. He's obviously in another dimension. So, in this one, Midoriya decided to lay low. At least until he knows a little bit more about this world. And know more about translation. Shit. And know how to use a little bit more of the computers. But really, he doesn't really care. He mostly tries his bet as to actually wander around. On the location. When he manages to actually know more about Japan and know more about its history... He gets a little bit of the adjustment, thinking, okay, so pretty much in this world, superheroes are a thing. Hmm. I'm gonna have to be careful in this one. So Midoriya decided to continue walking. Okay. When Midoriya managed to find an old cot, managed to find an old abandoned place, outside in the forest. Or small slip. It's abandoned, and it looks very much old. It looks like it was made in 1940. 40. 
but obviously it was made a lot older. Still, Midoriya still still made its home there. And when Midoriya managed to get there, he literally manages to make himself a little bit comfortable. Unfortunately, he had to repair his weapon considering that it got busted and in his last encounter with the kill that he's been making. Now, Midoriya actually managed to get out of there. Now, this is when... Not out of there, but this is when Midoriya actually managed to reforge his weapon. And, and it still looks like the same thing like in canon, and in mostly just a forged up blade. Yeah. But Midoriya knows he's going to have to use a new one considering that this weapon is old as hell, and it's a miracle it's even intact. So Midoriya has to be careful. Yeah. This is when Midoriya yeah, actually starts going to the grocery store. And he still wears the mask, but he also manages to find some clothes. Oh, oh, what the fuck am I kidding? Dang, I'm lying. We start off with Adoria actually now oh, coming out of the out of the abandoned place and immediately going after the one thing that he needs. And that is an old asylum. This old asylum has been around for quite some time. Midoriya knew it from the start. Right. So he's decided. It, not an asylum. Sheesh. He actually goes to a mall that's been enclosed. So he walks in, and the guard notices him. Hey, buddy, we're uh, we're closed. Immediately, this is when the guy sees his mask. Holy fuck! Fuck. Wait, <laughs> Jim, you motherfucker, dude, that's a hell of a mask. But uh, Halloween was like last month, dude. It's November. <laughs> And this one, Izuku grabs the guy by the throat and just snaps his neck. You can hear it. <laughs> Izuku drops the corpse while the, you just hear a thud coming from the corpse. And Izuku starts walking in. He starts looking around on any cheese one of the gates. He manages to open it just by pure strength alone. And Midoriya actually checks out some clothing for him. Normally, he would not have to be picky, but right now, the clothing he wears right now will immediately scream, Ah! Pedophile! And all that. So he knows he has to start looking for clothing. That and also his flesh doesn't really, really scream that he's normal. So pretty much, he starts grabbing some stuff. So technically, Midoriya now grabs as this is sentient of stuff. Oh. So after that, Midoriya's Aurea managed to actually bring up some old stuff that he managed to find in the last that's no location. Mostly some old bearings. Thanks. Mostly what he found was a shirt, some jacket, a shirt, a jacket, some pants, and some shorts and underwear. He brought a lot of underwear. So after that, Midoriya actually managed to get it to some another entity. Now when Izuku actually got there, Midoriya sees the gap. Right. So he manages to actually ride off into the next. So he gets back to his old home. And he actually starts, well, writing. That's all I gotta say, really. So, this is when Midoriya... Yeah, managed to actually like, get a density of what he's going. Unfortunately, Midoriya yeah, also comes across plus more stuff. This is when Midoriya starts doing. Alright. 
Anyway, sorry about that. This is when Midoriya literally goes to with his next cloak. Oh, okay. When you see, he's the one thing, the one thing, thing and that is literally the new. Now, with Midoriya, yeah, he managed to actually grab at some potential stuff. Also, mostly like food, water, supplies, that type of stuff. He does green drinks, but not that much. <sighs> this is when Midoriya... Yeah, actually grab him some more stuff. <sighs> Once he actually gets there... He actually, actually gets back to his old home and immediately. Lee, sorry about the pause. Immediately, Midoriya you know, just sits down and actually starts, well, eating his food. Or what's left, he, at least something he can eat. Like, he's actually not even complaining. As long as he's able to eat, he's able to eat. That's all he cares about. Like, why else would you care about? So, after that, Midoriya actually like, got up and started it actually right, actually started to doing his usual thing that any other killer would do. Oh. So, let's start it off. We start off with Midoriya literally just sitting down eating some food. But immediately, this is when he hears there is someone in the distance. And this is when he hears, Hey, dude, I dare you to go in that, that old abandoned place. What? Fuck you. I'm not going in there. What? Chicken? I I prefer my life. My dumbass. What the hell's your problem? You think I'm going to be stupid enough to go in there? Air? You're... Man... You are a fuck more dumber than I thought. Hey, it's just a jare. What are you, chicken? Then fuck you. I I prefer my life. Life over death. So, to answer your question, yes, I prefer to be alive. You can call me chicken all you want, but I want to be living. Living long enough to at least see my grandchildren. So, goodbye. Whatever, dude. I'm going in. If you start scream, if you report missing, I'm gonna laugh. <laughs> right, sure you will. Oh, Midoriya, yeah, just sitting there, a little bit annoyed that he can't eat his food in peace. But he gotta do what he gotta do. This is when the guy, this is when the person enters. Hello? Oh, man, this place is spooky. Maybe I should have went back home with Mineta. This one, this one, the person keeps going in, and this is when immediately the person sees food. Huh? Huh? Someone must be living here. Hello? Anyone living here? We're not. This place has been abandoned, sir. This one immediately. By the way, he's carrying a mat. Actually, the person is carrying a mat, and this is when he sees something in the distance, but he can't tell what. This one, and he's thinking, why am I carrying a match? He blows out the match and starts using his phone. Next thing you know, he sees Midoriya right in front of him. The guy immediately attempts to scream, but Midoriya grabs him by the, the jaw and yanks it out. The guy now with his tongue dangling out uh, and pretty much, uh, pretty much choking on his own blood, this is when Midoriya uh, cuts off his head. Okay. The body flumps on the ground, and Midoriya... It starts dragging the corpse out. Pretty much just throwing it. But it at some random location. Nothing too big. This is when Izuku... Who literally starts doing all that. What the hell? Oh, it's a snake. 
Anyway, this is when Mandoria. He had grabbed some stuff. So when Midoriya actually, actually managed to loot from the corpse from the person, this one he also grabs a license. He can't read it, so pretty much he keeps it to see if he can read it one day. Because he knows it's going to be difficult. This is when Midoriya sits up and starts Arts literally. Which, yeah. Now, Midoriya starts riding off, off into another location. Well, not riding, but he's pretty much just us oh, for fuck's sake. He pretty much sits down uh, and starts eating his food. Now, mostly he brought food that will last a while. Chips and all that. He doesn't bring that much junk food because, while well, he wants to eat healthy. The first thing he eats, he's at the top, is an apple. He got done eating the apple, and he admits he kind of misses eating the apples. Even he admit he misses this. This he's not going to lie. So Midoriya continues eating. And this is when immediately Midoriya... They got done eating. He starts right. This is when he starts. That's literally, literally getting to more locations. So he doesn't go to much location. Hence he starts exploring the woods. But he does look for other type of food. Just in case. Ace. But Midoriya. Yeah mostly also looted the kid's clothing. It's not that big. But he can mostly use it to make blankets or something. Because you never know. You might. I be needing those blankets. So Midoriya started doing that. When Midoriya got done on actually doing stuff, buff looting and all that, Midoriya also came across plus other thing. things. Things. Chemical holes and whatnot. But mostly this is when Midoriya starts, starts exploring his location. Then he came across Austin the new locate. Some location. Oh, great. This is when he sees a place that smell like, He starts smelling something. In, in sweet, but cardboard. Well, the way it starts looking in, and he just sees a bunch of kids smoking this type of pot. Midoriya right. does not know what that smell is, but he does know one thing. It smells weak here, but it smells nice at the same time. But his instinct's telling me that he should not be take. He should not even attempt to taste that stuff. So he starts going it. In. And this is when the guys just see him. And they obviously, Izuku does not need to be an expert. They are not right. And he says, Whoa, bro, check out that mask. That, that is determined to the, the tradition of hollow fucking weed, bro. Oh. Izuku, who he immediately looks at them like, What the fuck are you smoking? You want some weed, dude? Zuko has nothing to lose, and he's got nothing better to do. This is when he starts smoke. This is when he takes a sniff at it, and he immediately notices that this stuff will fuck up his mind. So Midoriya, Midoriya pretends to smoke it, and he gets done with it. Yeah, bro. Oh, kick it in. Ooh. And this is when he starts smelling the rest of the shit, and he notices meth. That's when he immediately realizes he actually reads one word that's in English. Meth. He's like, a little confused on what it is. This, but... Yeah. This is when Midoriya yeah, actually just kills the guys in their sleep. Well, actually, they, one guy actually like, killed himself. Well, because there was a pitchfork right behind him. He's like, shakes his head. Call himself an idiot. They call him an idiot. This is when Midoriya starts continue looking around. Huh. Now, when Midoriya actually got done... Done... Midoriya also came across other things. Things. Mostly apart from, from the usual thing, he still ill is killed them. Midoriya got done killing them, and he immediately, immediately managed to literally see the rest. Rest. 
However, Midoriya knows that this is not going to end well, so he mostly stick to him, stick to the walls. He managed to find more locations about the lo about stuff, but that doesn't mean it wasn't a difficulty thing to do. So when Midoriya actually started riding off, well, this is when Midoriya actually please start doing things. Mostly, he rides off. When I mean, he starts walking off, gets back to his location, minding his own business now. But Midoriya, that does not mean Midoriya also has some little ups and downs. This is when he sees more people literally seeing I mean, people checking out his home and sees a couple of hillbillies eating his shit. Midoriya gets angry and start, starts literally grabbing his weapon, charges at them, and just hits them right in the neck. That like, kills one instantly. Midoriya doesn't even hesitate. He killed the guy. Like, another hillbilly literally grabs a knife and starts trying to shank it. Him. But, but the guy loses horribly. Literally, lay the gun jams. This is when Midoriya grabs the guy by the head and starts slowly crushing it. The eyes pop out and then, and next thing you know, Midoriya crushes the head like a, like a freaking bag. Like, or actually more like one of those popper. Or those uh, bubble wrap things. Things. And Midoriya got just threw his corpse down. Midoriya now just, now just annoyed. Luckily, he realized the guy's only ate maybe like two or three apples. So he's not immediately mad, but he's still a little bit pissed that, that they did that. So he's a little bit angry. So after that, Midoriya you got done. And he pretty much... I just got uh, that usual thing. Anyway, damn. There we go. Anyway, this is when Izuku, who started, did well mining other things. He doesn't really care that much about others. So yeah. So pretty much he takes the corpses and he, he, well, leaves, obviously. He doesn't stay. So after that, Midoriya, he leaves the corpses and takes them outside. And he's been doing this for like two or three years, like two or three months. Months. He's pretty much been doing his usual thing. So after that, Midoriya, we get back to Midoriya. Yeah, who is now just walking into the store or the mall where it is always late and closed. Well, this time he sees another guard there. there. And that's when he realizes he, they tripled security after last time. Right. And everyone's been wondering about this mysterious serial killer that popped in Japan. Right. Immediately the guard just... Us, well, does that. This is when Midoriya sits up and sits down. <sighs> Before, but this one Izuku also starts smoking a cigarette, but this one he hears, FREEZE! Izuku gives the guy the look like, can I at least finish my cigarette? And, but the guy doesn't get that look. Put your hands in the air! Here. Izuku who sits up, and the guy just sees how fucking big Midoriya is. Put your hands in the air. I am not asking again. Hey. Hands in the air. Here. Here. That's what Izuku does. He puts his hands in the air. Turn around. Izuku turns around. And this is when the guy attempts to cuff him, but Midoriya backhand, backhands him. And sending the guy flying, and Midoriya starts pinning him down. Immediately, the guy is struggling to get up, but he also tries to kick Midoriya and start punching, punching and all that. But Midoriya, the strength is far more or stronger than the guy's, so the guy is now just struggling to breathe. Midoriya, he starts suffocating the guy, and the guy is obviously in a 
agony. He is he can tell that Midor that he doesn't want to die. The tears start going up from the guy, but this is when he gets sh Izuku gets shot in the shoulder. Or and the guy let go, and next thing you know, you hear the guy gasping for air. You okay, dude? <laughs> yeah. This is when Midoriya gets annoyed. Grab his weapon and just throws it right at the guy. Hits the guy right in the chest. Yeah, so blood gushes out and he starts spitting out blood as well. Well, and this is when Midoriya starts walking to his blade. This is when and the guy brings out a pocket knife and immediately a stab, attempts to stab Midoriya, but Midoriya grabs him, pins him to the wall, and puts the pocket knife like, like directly to the throat. This is when the guy is struggling to keep the pocket knife like away from his well, throat. But this is when Midoriya you know, gets his ass. And this is when Midoriya has the superior strike and pierces the guy's his neck, causing the guy to bleed out. This is when he just yanks the blade, which causes it to break and immediately kills the guy. Izuku shakes his head and picks up his remaining cigarette. That took care of that. Midoriya realized that his blade, he tries to yank it, but it uses here a click. Midoriya picks up his blade to see that it's completely shattered. Midoriya now more annoyed that he has to pick out a new weapon. Midoriya starts going to the weapons aisle and literally looks around, and this is when Midoriya catches the eye of a machete. Yeah, you're all probably thinking, is this a Jason Voorhees reference? It should be. Hey. But Midoriya looks at it and sees how sturdy it looks. Looks, so he accepts it. But he was smart enough to actually break the thing that goes eh, 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 that type of thing. So Midoriya just ignores it and just continues right, started to continue walking. After that, Midoriya notices the other thing. Okay? And that is your usual little thing. Midoriya walk, rides, I mean, bleh. Midoriya picks up the machine, but he also picks up a couple of bear traps that he saw while in the hunting thing power. He also picks up a combat knife just in case if he loses his machete. So he starts walking off. So when Midoriya got done with that, Midoriya also noticed it says one other thing. The smoke. He starts noticing saying the smoke coming from on the district. So he starts walking over there. But this is when he notices a couple of people just killing some people. Midoriya doesn't pay no mind until he sees a certain person and being pinned and literally having a knife. Now the guy can immediately tell this kid must be at least four or five years old. And he remembers the time that his father was forced to beat people up. He knows abusiveness when he sees it. And the person paying this many years, you to who would have thought your own dad would sell you off? <laughs> Don't worry, little boy. We'll take good care of you. Immediately Midoriya gets that image in his head. Doesn't take a fucking expert to know. Oh, a psychopath when he sees one, immediately Midoriya he walks over there in freaking hostile mode, obviously. And actually starts going over there. Midoriya, not being the idiot, he goes goes to the guy and literally just threw ooh, his new machete directly into the guy's chest. This is when Midoriya opens the bear trap and literally puts it on one guy's head, upper side. Like, and literally just uh, shrank. You just hear the skull splattering all over. The guy attempts to shoot Midoriya, but Midoriya grabs the gun and starts shooting it directly into the guy's throat, and then shoots the guy right in the hand, who is pretty much holding the kid. It, this is when Midoriya grabs his other thing, another, another type of weapon. But he, 
And this one he just sees a chainsaw. The guy attempts to attack the Izuku with the chainsaw, but Izuku starts pushing the chainsaw back to the guy. Start pushing and pushing and pushing. Pushing until the guy I is literally nothing more. Or then <laughs> All you hear is just the guts being thrown around, start or being teared apart. Or you literally just hear the guy going like screaming in agony. And after all that. This is when Midoriya literally like gets done with that. So you can imagine the pure annoyance that Midoriya had to go through. So after that, Midoriya yeah, got done killing them, and this is when Midoriya starts walking back. This is when the guy, the kid, immediately runs back to his mama, but who is just waiting. The mom, um, just cheers up and all that, but doesn't see Zuku. In fact, she has no idea where he is. He's actually quite surprised that Midoriya managed to get back to the cabin. But immediately, this is when he immediately, this is when he realized something's off. The door, it is open. But Doria never kept the door open. Not once. This is when Midoriya starts taking the long way. He takes a long way around. He knows something is up. Oh, he ain't stupid. Fit, he's not a fucking idiot. So after Midoriya literally looking around, he sees a hero, a couple of heroes who are ready to jump him. Yeah. This is when Midoriya takes the back out, but he also sees a hero literally waiting on the window too, but doesn't see him, like a fucking idiot. Yet that the heroes are. So Midoriya took the long way. So he starts taking the long way around. He starts, starts doing all that. Midoriya literally. They took out. Out. And this is when Midoriya takes out all the heroes one by one. And this is when he snaps one's neck, stabs one guy in the heart, stuck, or splits one's head open, then punches the guy in the throat so hard that he starts suffocating, being and forgetting to breathe. Breathe. And also doing other things. Thanks. Midoriya also grabbed up the near it. His weapon, which was his machete. He, he managed to pick it up from the ground, by the way. They forgot to mention that. Right. Midoriya also grabs a sword. He also grab, grabs other things. But immediately, immediately, Midoriya, Midoriya also sees another hero. Bro. And you can tell he's trying to do the smart thing and want, wants to not get killed. But unfortunately, he knows that he has to. This is when Midoriya goes to, to the hero. Now, the hero notices him and says, Holy shit! And the guy attempts to shoot Midoriya, but the Midoriya uh, it grabs the gun and literally counters it. He starts destroying winging the guy and literally starts breaking in the guy's will to live. And this is when Midoriya grabs it. Ah, this is when Midoriya just knocks him out. Um, and literally hits him in the ground. He starts looking at him and literally he just gives a look like, what made you thought it was a good idea to attack me? This is when the guy just takes a good look at Midoriya, but doesn't say anything. Hey, because mostly because he doesn't understand Midoriya. He's speaking in an old English back in the day. This is when he starts starts trying his best to speak in Japanese. He's he says something in Japanese, but the guy just looks at him like, "What?" This is when he grabs a book. This is when the guy immediately notices. Oh. 
This one, Nikki Izuku literally writes down in Japanese because he's married. He needs to write it out successfully, saying, Why are you in my house? So what is or not? And he starts speaking in Japanese. Izuku doesn't know what the fuck he's saying. Until the guy... Until Midori gave him a look, and he immediately got it. Because we were looking for you. Izuku, okay, just says, You mean... You mean to tell me you spoke English this entire time? You could have just saved us both the trouble? Oh, oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Serial Killer. I thought we were here to catch a wanted criminal that's been killing people for the past three or four days. Not make friends. Yeah, touche. Hey, but anyway, why are you here? Are you dumb to capture you? So, yeah, we've been looking for you. Oh, and good God, that mask is horrifying. Thanks, I made it myself. Oh, well, you definitely know how to make someone shit their pants before they die. Hey, Jesus. Well, anyway, you still haven't answered my question. Why are you here? Here, with so little men besides to capture me. Did you hear reports about a boogeyman or something? Yeah, you. You're literally a wanted criminal. You've been killing people for the past three or four months. Just have to get by somehow. Oh. Okay. This is when, Midor this is when the guy literally grab. This is when the guy tries to un unloose himself, but, but then he realizes if he does, the bear trap will go off. Well, aren't you sneaky? Thanks. Thanks, I ain't stupid. So... I, you know me, but I don't know you. So who are you? <sighs> My name is Shinzo. Shinzo. Yeah, Shinzo. Never heard of you. I'm a hero. Aren't you a little old to listen to bedtime short? Aren't you a little bit old to listen to bedtime stories? <laughs> a realist. That's a first. You have to be. Where well, I was back then. Anyway, so you're here to literally lead just for what? Shits and giggles? Well, or are you actually here just to hunt down a, a serial killer that literally kills people for God knows how long? Anyway, this is when Midoriya says, well, oh, yeah, that's pretty much it. It's, huh. Well, you're well welcome for sparing you then. Huh. Not to tell me twice. So... This is when Midoriya starts walking off. Hey, where are you going? I'm gonna get myself something to eat. This is when Midoriya grabs a pear. You're only gonna eat a pear? You're not gonna cook something? He's gonna get this says, what the fuck can I cook? Do you see anywhere I could cook? Well, fair point. Okay, fair point. Exactly. What the fuck? Could I cook a nice juicy steak? Think no. No, oh, I think you and I both know we can't do that. Such a realist, as he's thinking. But this is when Midoriya also start arts giving out other things. Makes perfect wolf pelts. Glad, fantastic. This is when Midori yeah, sits down. Oh, wait a minute. Man, what about me? You're going to keep me as a hostage? Midori remembers what his father would say about feet not feeding the weak, but this one he just shakes his head. Wow, thanks. You're a help. No, it's... Ugh. This is when Midori starts cutting up a pear, and he starts giving it to him. He takes the... He bite this one, and Shinzo starts eating the pear. Here. But this one he... This is when Midori, he gets a closer look at Midoriya's eyes. 
one is one side is red, the other side is green. Can I at least get your name? I forgot my name, really. So much has changed over the past years. <laughs> you sound like you're not born here. And this year, I wasn't. You wouldn't believe me if I told you. Surprise me. I was born in the 1900s. <laughs> You're joking, right? Do I look like I'm joking? Hard to tell with the mask on. Izuku takes off his mask, and immediately Shinzo blushes, realizing how good looking he is. Seeing the green hair, hair. Yeah, Izuku has a scar on his lip to all the way. Uh, has a scar to his cheeks all the way to his lip. Yep. But it's nothing too bad. And he just looks at Midoriya. Yeah. I, I, my name, name is Izuku. He says the last name because I don't remember. Wait, wait, wait. That, those, that Izuku? Yep, you heard of me? Dude, everyone heard about your father. No one wanted to do anything to do with that guy. Can't say I blame him. Bastard made my life a living hell. So I can't really blame you. Well, that's good to know. Anyway, so, uh, thanks for sparing you. Yeah. Don't mention it, kid. <laughs> right. Well, anyway, you should probably, probably get ready. For what? But your stay. I'm not letting you leave anytime soon. I can't say I blame you. I mean, I know, I know what you look like, so you're probably never gonna take any chance of me. Nope. But you would like that, wouldn't you? I would like not to be tied up, but I know I'm not gonna get what I what you want, what I want. That's for damn sure. Where? Anyway, that's a good, it comfy. This woman Doria starts getting up. Now Shinzo pretty much sitting there. This one. And he starts pretty much sleeping. Next thing you know, Midoriya wakes up. up and literally... They start... Arts his usual routine. Now, Shinzo just sits there because he knows he can't do anything. But this is when he immediately... The only time he's actually let to get out is when he needs to pee. That's it. That's the only time he's allowed out. And that's the when he's only. And that's when he's lucky. Midoriya starts holding... This is when Midoriya uh, kept holding Shinzo as a hostage for quite some time. Right. They got to talk... This is when Shinzo started getting to know Midoriya a little bit better. better. Mostly he starts to know him actually a lot better than what normal people would. Like, normally Midoriya would be one of those people that would scare him, but Shinzo starts seeing him a little bit different. All he sees is just a guy. Like, born out of his own time, and doesn't know anything about the modern world. So Shinzo just feels more bad. And Masu Izuku actually starts telling his side of the story. Right, and how his father betrayed him for because of, he was loyal. Well, Doria also notice it. it. Says others, mostly certain things. But he also knows he has to be careful, especially around Shinzo. Shinzo started to feel more pity, pity for Izuku than anything. 
As a matter of fact, he can't. He doesn't even want to arrest him. He just wants to give the guy therapy at this rate. Okay. But he's even wouldn't let him go. Oh, even Shinzo knows not to go that, that far. Because he wants to gain his trust. Doesn't want to get killed. So after that, Midoriya grab have certain parts of this is when Midoriya just gets up. Well, I'm going to bed. See you in the morning. See ya. By the way, this has been going on for like five to ten months. That's how long Midoriya has been keeping uh, him as a hostage. Immediately, this is when Midoriya starts sitting down. Oh. When Midoriya starts, this is when he just sleeps. The next morning happens, Midoriya wakes up and sees Shinzo. Oh, pretty much just sleeping on him. Midoriya gets a look, thinking, I could have sworn I tied you up. This is when he sees... He, this is when he looks around, just realizing on how, trying to get the memo on how the fuck he managed to get out. Like, literally, Midori's looking around like, how the hell did you get out? I literally, I know, I know I tied you up. There is no way you got out of there that easily. This is when he realized Shinzo, oh, has his foot removed and had to use his own claw for bandages. Immediately, Midori gets the idea. Oh, you goddamn idiot. This is when Midori picks up Shinzo and starts actually... They looking at the wounds, realizing that they pretty much been they're pretty much good, at least for now. But Izuku can tell Oh that they're not gonna he's not be able to do any hero work because without feet. So Midoriya start starts picking up Shinzo. Knowing that Shinzo can no longer leave. This one Shinzo wakes up. Oh, um, hi. That was stupid of you. I didn't mean to. The chair broke. The chair broke. He nods. How does a chair break? Normally, chairs don't easily break. Well, mine did. It was getting old, and... This one easily gets it. The weight ate. He knows that the weight is actually the one that causes the thing to die. So he started to get it. It hit pretty quickly. Doesn't take an expert. So Midoriya starts getting the memo. Alright. I think that actually makes sense. But be more careful next time. You could have woke me. I tried. You were a heavy sleeper. This is when Doria thinks, Oh yeah, I forgot I am. Well, it looks like you'll be sleeping on the couch as well. Don't you have a bed? Then half the place has literally been an abandoned. And if the chair does that, I do not. If any, and if a single chair does that, I'm more worried about the couch. Right. This is when Midoriya gets up and starts walking. Luckily, Amer yeah. Luckily, Midoriya yeah, starts feeding him as well. This is when Midoriya gives him, a, him some peaches. He mo mostly... So he, he... Shinzo is loving the peaches. He enjoys them. After, join after enjoying the peach, and Midoriya eats his, his filling... He pretty much just sits down, lays down. I mean, this one, Shinzo, just lays back down. Huh. But this one, he lays on Izuku's chest. Mostly realizing how comfortable it is. And how much he feels safe. Izuku actually starts petting Shinzo. And the next thing he heard from Shinzo is purring. Midori is thinking, I didn't know humans. Huh. You're purring. That's a first. Normally they'd be begging for me to release you. Hmm. 
Genzo gets comfortable and starts. This is when he. This is when Izuku decided to sing what his mother used to sing to him when he was a kid. Okay. When he was just a kid, before his father killed him. You are my sunshine. So pretty much he starts singing that song, and he, well, Shinzo immediately falls asleep. Starts tearing up, too, because this is when he also realized that his mother sang that, too. So Midoriya starts getting the memo. After singing that song into, it, into Shinzo's heart, Shinzo immediately falls asleep. And the only thing that Midoriya is happy to see is a smile on his face while Shinzo is asleep. Immediately, just when he hears a couple of a creak, Midoriya starts getting in action mode, grabs machete, Eddie, and literally like, gently puts Shinzo's down. Oh. And this is when he starts checking the hall. This is when immediately he sees another student. Come on, we gotta get Shinzo. Dude, all of them said that Shinzo's dead now. The trapper must have got him. The trapper... Burp. Come on, dude. That's just a serial killer. It's probably just some, some weakling anyway. He's going to give us a look like, I'm going to show you weakling in a minute. Oh, come on. Besides, Shinzo's our friend. You're just going to save him because he does your homework for you. This is when Midoriya literally starts grabbing in his sister. His sense it's tutorials. So yeah, Midoriya after that, after grabbing a couple of material and well surviving better. Now he managed to actually take out a couple of things. So, after that, that is the words I would say, Midoriya move, moves away. Starts literally... Lee, well, doing his thing. So, after literally... Lee, this is when the heroes say... Look, we literally can't get... Sure, I know he's my friend, but I'm just horrified. Stop being a coward. Only weaklings are cowards. Immediately, this is when Izuku just swings his blade and chops off, off to his head. Immediately, the guy starts screaming. And this is when Izuku shows up, grabs the guy by the mouth, and just breaks his jaw, and then punches him so hard that his heart comes out. And then he jabs the heart or directly into his mouth, and the last thing that Midoriya says to them is, Now swallow. If you all got that reference on where I got that idea, check up a Death Battles Homelander vs. Omni-Man. You and I know who that fucking fight was going to win against. And <laughs> After that, Midoriya yeah, start, starts crushing the skull like a grape. This is when the he other hero tries to use... Uh, well, this is when her hand turns big. Midoriya sees that, and he bluntly says, Oh, so that's how you lose your fatness. Oh, you mother! And that's when Izuku just throws, a foreign, throws his combat knife directly into the girl's head, and you just hear a thud. That was easy. This is when immediately Izuku goes back, and this is when Shinzo just looks at him with a worried look. Not like a warp. This is when he just starts going to him, but Shinzo grabs him and hugs him. Yeah. Starts crying. Izuku's starting to think that maybe UA is not as nice as he's thinking. Because if a, ser if a certain hero is hugging a serial killer, and is more worried about the serial killer than his friends, then it immediately screams, Oh, I am not a nice person. I am not nice. I have no oh, niceness in my soul. I am a racist Christian. Oh, fuck me, I burst. <laughs> I meant to do my Karen voice. Fuck. I did not mean to use that voice. My mistake, people. <laughs> Sorry. Hey. 
Anyway, this is when Midoriya starts losing. Well, not losing, but you get what I mean. Midoriya starts sitting up, realizing what he's doing. This is when Midoriya sits up, realize. This is when he just lays down with him. Anyway, after that, Shinzo started actually convinced. Start is act now just trying to convince Izuku to move in with him. Izuku doesn't like the idea, but he realizes that the house is becoming more and more attacked than usual. It's actually getting annoying. And so Midoriya finally agreed, and Shinzo is happy. When Shinzo and Izuku got home, this is when immediately they knock on the door. Coming, coming. This is when he opens it, and this is when his Shinzo's father sees Shinzo. Um, hi, Dad. Hi, baby. This is when immediately, I, this is when immediately, he hugs him. Midori gets a look, but he calms down. Oh, well, actually, no, he stays calm. So, who's this? Izuku was about to say something, but this is when Shinzo says, Oh, this is my boyfriend. He's the one who saved me. Ow! What? 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 This is when Midoriya gets it. Oh! Gotcha! Oh, really? I want proof. Izuku follows it up and literally starts kissing him. But Shinzo blushes, and immediately Shinzo just starts going in embarrassed mode. Oh, then starts blushing. This is when Izuku realized that he's also a cat. Like, no, literally, Shinzo has, like, one of those cat ears and cat tails. And this one he immediately, this one Aizawa has, okay, says, okay, that's enough proof. So, nice to meet you. My name is Aizawa. You? Izuku. Oh, nice grip. You left? He nods. So, what about the serial killer? He was gone when I managed to get him. I see. Well, don't worry. We'll find this person. This one he realized the wheelchair. What happened to your leg? Oh, <laughs> did the serial killer do this? No, no. I did it to myself. Care to elaborate? Okay, I will. What I mean to say is I didn't mean to hurt myself. What happened was the chair I was on got old and it started creaking and, well, it broke as soon as... Oh, no knee, no knee, no me no anymore. I get the message. It's immediately Midoriya is thinking, I hope, well, at least we know one thing. Ain't about your family? They're stupid. He's just thinking in his head, well, we know one thing about your family. Hey, they're stupid! Hey. <laughs> Midoriya just gives that look. Look, but he doesn't give a full look because he doesn't want Onizawa to be a little bit suspicious. So, you are... Well, it's nice to meet you, Izuku. I am Aizawa. Aizawa? You probably know that. And this is my husband, President Mike. Yo, listener! Izuku covered his ear because he was loud. Oops, sorry. <laughs> Bad habit. Nice to meet you. Izuku bluntly says, why does he look like a cop? Why does he look like a parrot? <laughs> it's my hair! Here, you need a haircut. What? I, what, you jealous? Ow. Oh, I'd be very... Dude, why would I be jealous, jealous about uh, uh, worrying about using more shampoo for my hair? Here. Ah. <laughs> He's got you there, honey. Oh, shut up. So, you are Shinzo's boyfriend? Yup. You really picked the number. Wait, why are you wearing a mask? Oh, I don't like showing my face. It's, uh, I don't like my scar. Eh, it's understandable. I used to not show my face all the time. Really? Of course. Of course. So, wait, what happened to your leg? What happened to your feet? He expl Shinzo explains. Well, okay, that actually makes sense now I think about it. But still, how did you manage to get out? My boyfriend. And he managed to sneak in while the serial killer was running around. Oh, okay. So, did you do the thing yet? 
Izuku bonks him in the head and yells, Pervert! Or, Ow! It was just a question! It's a pervert question! And it's extremely inappropriate. Ugh, another Aizawa! Say, why don't you attend to UA? Uh, I'm quirkless, sorry. Oh, well that's a shame. You would have been a great hero. You know, Izuku thinking, what is with people in bedtime stories? I don't get it! It. Uh, what's with that look? <laughs> he told me one time that we were dating that I told him I was a hero. He bluntly said, Babe, aren't you a little old for uh, bedtime stories? That. <sighs> he actually said that. <laughs> yeah, he doesn't believe in heroes. He think it's. Uh, he doesn't believe they exist. They just, in his mind, they're just people, but who trying to play God because they have superpowers. Wow. No, no, dude. He's looking at us look like. Don't judge me. I have my rights to think that. I mean, don't get me wrong. You do have your rights, I, and I'm not wrong. There are some heroes I am not proud of working with. It's, but don't worry. But that also means you can no longer be a hero, Shinzo. I'm actually glad I can't be a hero, and you know why. Eh, true. Oh. Wait, shit. Wait, Izuku. This is when Izuku gets to look like, can we come in? Oh, right. This is when they start going in. And Midoriya immediately... This is when Aizawa says, Mind if I talk to Izuku for a bit? Uh, sure, Dad. Hey, Shinzo, why don't you help me to make some tea? Sure. This is when Midoriya sits down, and immediately Aizawa gets into intimidation mode. And so does Midoriya. So, you are the... So... Oh. You're... Shinzo's boyfriend? Yes. How did you two meet? In the arcade. Arcade, huh? Okay... Which arcade? Uh, uh, I don't know much. I'm Amer. I was a only in a, this little country for a little bit. I'm from America. Hmm. That makes sense. So, which part of America you're in? This one, Izuku was thinking. Bluntly said, Texas. Hmm. How come? I was born in Texas, but I was raised in Tennessee. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Okay, okay. Hey, that mask. Well, where did you buy it? Oh, I made it actually. What's the material? Uh, wood. Wood. Yeah, it's made of uh wood. He's just trying his very best to bullshit the guy, but he knows that this is not gonna end well. <laughs> so it's made from. Um, just wood. There is no... Ooh, that's it. Yeah. There's nothing else. Yep. Hmm. Where did you get that machete? Protection. I'm corkless. I need the prote have protection. And plus, there is no license against having a weapon. Correct? Especially if it's a melee weapon. Hmm, this one Shinzo says, this one Aizawa says, alright, alright, Izuku, this one he just gives the look like, why do I got a feeling he's not falling for this? It's, this one, Aiz, this one uh, Aizawa just locks off. Have fun at our, welcome to our home then, Izuku. <laughs> uh, great, hey, Izuku. This one Midoriya just walked off. And this one he gets to Shinzo, who's just got them and making the tea. Oh, thanks. Hmm. All right, is that all? Yep, you may go. Oh, then. He's just thinking in his head, Phew! That was close. I was worried I was going to end up dead. But I am going to say this. You break my son's heart, heart, I'll break your fucking spine. 
Izuku is not even close to intimidated, but he has to give respect to him, considering how intimidated he just tried to be. He? So, yeah. But the word is not even close close to intimidated. This is when Midoriya starts eating his meal. But this is when Midoriya literally starts eating the meal that they've created. And also drinking the tea. Hey. <laughs> After that, Midoriya actually got done with his food. Food. He immediately he decided to actually travel a little bit. This is when Midoriya literally he starts grabbing things, some materials, mostly your normal day thing that you would normally get from other things. So Midoriya start, starts, well, doing his usual thing. So, yeah, that was interesting. But luckily, Midoriya is not, not the person they actually told a grudge. But that's the best part. So, after that, that this is when Midoriya... Yes, it's that. I mean, this is when Midoriya starts eating their food. Let's say he starts eating bear stew. When he starts eating stew. He eats the stew, and it turns out fantastic. And holy fuck. After that, this is when Midoriya says, Alright, thanks for the meal. And I'll be taking Shinzo to bed. Of course, of course. Of course. After taking Shinzo to bed, this is when Aizawa... Awa and, well, his husband start talking. So, what do you think of his boyfriend? What do you think of Shinzo's boyfriend? I think he's hiding something. Ugh, you're always thinking someone's hiding something. No, 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 no. I mean, like, he's legit hiding something. But I don't know what. I just got a bad feeling about the guy. Hey. <laughs> you always have a bad feeling about somebody. Well, this one is reasonable. I just got a bad feeling about him. Call me paranoid all you want. But I have my suspicion. Right, right. Hey, suspicion. And I hope you're not going to be like that towards his or them because they're in love. We can't force people to soul out away from their love. It's not that. Just call it trust issues. All right. Okay. Hey. After that, this one Shinzo. Oh, when they get to their room, immediately Shinzo is now just blushing and just holding on onto Izuku. This one, and Izuku says, eh, sorry about uh, kissing you. This one Shinzo just kisses him again, and Shinzo says, I don't mind it. I've actually been wanting to ask you out. You were gonna ask me out. The person who... Oh, yeah, but I'm okay with it. Truth be told, you're a lot better than my ex. Your ex? Yeah. 
the guy you killed. You know that guy you killed? You know, the one you chopped off your head? You chop off the head? <sighs> yeah, I know. That was my ex. He's been trying to get back to me ever since I broke up with him. Why? Why'd you broke up with him? He cheated on me. He's a good thinking. Well, now I don't even feel pity. Yeah. Sucked. Anyway, uh, pause break for a little bit. All right, I'm back. Now, what was I? Oh, yeah. Midoriya start, or is actually checking the, uh, prep. Is the word I would use? Yeah, prep. He literally starts prep, starts checking the prep ring. On the, uh, thing. This is when Midoriya actually, actually sleeps. The next morning happens, and immediately Izuku wakes up, but to see shit Aizawa just watching him, and from the frickin' ceiling. The fuck? Izuku just gives them the look like, what the fuck? Yo. Don't yo me. Izuku just gives him the look like, don't fucking yo me. How, what are you doing in this ceiling? Wait. Wait. I don't trust you. I got my eye on you. Are you going to sing a song while you're at it? Anyway, this is when Midoriya starts swing, starts sleeping. Hmm. Anyway, Midoriya starts literally sitting down. Now and just see, this is when he just wakes up to pick up Shinzo, takes him to the bathroom to get washed up and all that. And Midoriya literally just says, hmm. Huh. Yeah, this is when Izuku immediately just starts singing and starts singing in the shower. Shinzo immediately just purring and just enjoying the music of his music. And yeah, this is when they hear this is when I they hear as I was saying, and yes, he's here, and no, he can't be a hero anymore. So ha ha, take that, you ugly fucking rat! At the super gives the look like the fuck is going on. Something is obviously right. Right? Because a normal person would not do that. These are gonna start checking out the perp. We start this one eight managed to get done. And this one Midoriya just see. Ease them. This one he sees Izuku. I mean, this one Izuku sees uh, a rat. The hell? And who this might be you? And who might you be, sir? None of your damn business. Yes, that's obviously for sure. This one he, Nezu just gives a look like you're making powerful enemies. I'm not, luckily for Izuku, he does not give a shit. It. If I'm gonna make powerful enemies, well, at least look powerful. Well, so, uh, who was that guy? Oh, no one too big. That's just Nazu, the principal of UA. He, Izuku looks at him. And the guy who can't even catch a single serial killer. Or apparently. Huh. Well, whatever. It's not my problem anyway. Hey, got more thing, more important things. 
things, then, well, care about what this guy has to say. Like? Uh, Shinzo, obviously? Oh. Well, see ya, Aizawa. See ya. With the Izuko, who, who's gone back, back to, uh, Shoto, Shinzo. Well, he's pretty much Shinzo's just sitting there and just waiting for his return, because he was given a look, look, a worried look. But Izuko came back, and he just, let's start, starts going back to home. Shinzo just pretty much starts, it's getting closer to him. Um, and Izuku is okay with it. After a little, after getting done in the shower, Izuku decided to take a Shinzo to his room, I mean, to his room, to, well, obviously, to take care of him. Why else would he want to go there? After that, Midoriya start. This is when Midoriya takes him back inside. Right. And, and just sits him down. Well, not sit him down, but he mostly takes him to the dining room. Thanks. No problem. Look. After all, well, it's my job to protect. After all, it's my job uh, as a lover to protect you. Who was at the door anyway? Oh, someone named Nezu. I don't fucking know. This is when Izuku turns on on the news, and immediately you just hear We'll do this. Midoriya starts sitting down and he start, starts watching TV. This is when they hear about the news about the serial killer. He's just good as just thinking in his head. Yeah, they've been talking about this. He's just thinking in his head. Damn, they've been talking about me for the past three or four weeks. I didn't think I was that popular. I mean, I got the feeling that I was threat, a threat, but I didn't think I was that big of a threat. And I've only been killing 10,000 people this week. Eek. But maybe it's why he's actually stopped the killing. At least until the father doesn't suspect me being the killer anymore. Let's see what we got. After that, this is when Midoriya managed to actually they see more of the kills for some fucking reason. He's in. They thought it'd be a good idea for people to be able to hear the lately. Ace murders. And that's when they talk about the murders of the UA students. The same students that Izuku does not give a shit and, and killed a necessary long ago. But really, Izuku does not give a shit. It. And truth be told, in his mind, he's glad they're dead. Doesn't have to worry about them. After that, Midoriya, 
Oria and Shinzo will just continue their day. Hey, after literally a year, here they no longer expected Midoriya he had to be anything bad, so they stopped suspecting him. A good thing, too, Midori was getting the itch. She was actually driving Midoriya nuts. So Midoriya pretty much did what he did. Let's do this. Doria mostly takes care of his usual thing. Okay. But after that, Midoriya... Yeah, also contains his normal... ...ness. So, after that, this one Midoriya... And we now get to Midoriya killing a couple of people. Mostly killing a couple of people of resident and whatnot. not. Well, butchering their heads and the usual thing that a normal person would do. Well, normally. After five or six hours of non-stop of killing, Midoriya decided to head home. Luckily, he was smart enough to wear something like a butcher's knife. A butcher apron around Found him so the clothes don't get covered in blood. But believe me, hey, it's a pain in the ass. <sighs> After that, Midoriya gets back to the house, and Shinzo is waiting for him. But mostly, he's not mad. I mean, you gotta do something. Thing and Shinzo wasn't really mad, so it's just a slow progress. Midoriya, this one Midoriya hops back in bed, and Shinzo, oh, just starts calling with him. After five to six, six hours pass, Midoriya, Midoriya starts sleeping, peeping, wakes up, and starts doing his usual routine. And this is when and we get to Izuku. But this is when we get back to Izuku at nighttime. And Izuku starts chopping up pieces. Pieces here and there. And pretty much starts killing pe people as usual. But this is when he hears, So, you are the legendary retrapper that everyone's been hearing about. But Doria throws, his, throws a friggin' back. That's it, right at the guy. Which killed those the henchmen. Huh. Not even hesitating. We have a job for you. He's going to stay silent, doing his usual trapper thing. Strong and si strong silent type. I like it. All for one need wants you wants your help. Nope. Oh. To uh, kill a couple of students of UA. Midoriya stays silent. Okay. The reward will be a lifetime supply, and you'll have a powerful ally. Meaning you'll be able. Well, to literally do the usual thing. <laughs> this one made Mordoria nods. Splendid! We will contact you as soon as you're able. <laughs> this one Midoriya starts walking towards them. This one Midoriya literally gets it. And this is when... And he grab this is when he immediately he starts walking back home. Shinzo doesn't expect a thing, and Midoriya and Shinzo is now just sleeping with his boyfriend. But this is when immediately Shinzo Oh well, wakes up, and Midoriya wakes up as well, pretty much coloring together. But this is when and Shinzo starts kissing him and just be happy. But this is when we hear the other ring 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 ring. Ring, 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 ring. 
ring, 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 ring. This one I saw will open. Pretty much. Punch grabs his phone. What? <sighs> oh, sorry. Reiza. Sorry, I would love of to help you, but uh, it's my day off, so my answer for that will be nope. And he hangs up. Hey, what was that about? Ah, Nezu wants me to go to the field trip above UA or something. Then something I don't give a shit about. Huh. And Aizawa starts walking off. He starts getting up and starts making dinner. Well, not dinner, but breakfast. After making I mean, breakfast, he starts eating. So, what's this about the USJ? Eh, Aizawa starts explaining it. This is when Izuku gets it. Saying, thinking in his head. Oh, so, that's what they meant by the USJ. Hey. That's good to know. This is when Midoriya just sits down. Oh, and he's eating. Oh, and so, did you do sleep well? No. Like a baby. <laughs> I bet. I'm glad to know that you two slept well. Oh. So, you're not going to go to the USJ? Um, that's a no. I guess anything's possible. Hmm. Anything else? No, that's about it. Alrighty. You ready, Aiza? This is one of Izuku. Oh, after a couple of weeks, the murders continue to and contestify. And, and Aizawa just pretty much gave up. He does not care anymore. The villain, like the serial killer, has been gone and going for weeks. They have no idea where, he is, where the kill's going. Besides, the fucking kills are randomized too, which makes it worse. Worse for the heroes, so they don't know where he is attacking. Okay. After an hour, or Midoriya, after a couple of hours, after a couple of weeks, Midoriya and me, they got the got the message about the USJ. So they start to get ready. Well, Izuku starts to get ready. And he shows up, and lucky for him, Aizawa won't be there, so he won't have to worry about a fight, about knocking out Aizawa, making things a little bit suspicious. This should yes me, but this is when he also, this is when Izuku notices another serial killer that's from the entity. You just hear a creepy, maniacal, fucked up laughter. Or this one, I this one is out. This one, uh, I, Shigaraki says, "Do we really need the doctor?" Or, yes, he is an important asset. This is when the doctor looks at Izuku. You. Oh. Izuku thinking, "Oh no, not you." Oh boy. And for those who do not know who the doctor is, shout out to singer player Cheese. He's Nacho. Here you fucking go. Pizza Hut. I don't care about Pizza Hut. Alrighty, what's up guys? Single player Nacho here. And we're back with another creepy lore video for The Doctor in Dead by Daylight. And well, you're in for a shock for how absolutely demented this man is and how he became an extreme psychopath and yet a very brilliant scientific mind, though for all the wrong reasons. The doctor is what happens when you get a little bit of poison in that apple. This guy is so sick. And I've covered a lot of sick people on this channel. 
The doctor, also known as Herman Carter, was seen by many in the scientific community as an up-and-coming Nikola Tesla. If Tesla was really into torture experiments, I didn't want to do this to you guys, but here's a close-up of his face. Yeah. He gives me approximately one million questions. The doctor has a mouth-opening device that reminds me of one of those YouTube trends from 2016, as well as eye enlargers, so that he's always watching you. And those pupils are so dilated. It's gotta be crack. His skin is all bruised up from electroshock experiments he concocted himself. It's gotta be burnt skin. I mean, Jesus Christ. Cover it up. All in all, the doctor has a lot of facial equipment, probably puts a good 10 pounds on his face, and this design goes hand in hand with Herman's obsessive, neurotic personality. His entire fit just screams, I want to make you suffer to the best of my abilities and brain power. It's just kind of funny to me that he also has a clean cut suit with a sleeveless top. A little uh, f***ing crazy on the face, but then very clean down below. But it all fits in perfectly with the doctor's contradictory nature. And most Dead by Daylight killers have very tragic backstories, but the doctor chose his path. I think this is probably the first real serial killer that did not kill out of necessity or vengeance, which is also bad, but because he liked it. He liked the feeling of making other people suffer. So much so that he gained this maniacal laughter. Yeah, that's the stuff of nightmares. <laughs> could he have been saved? Is there a point in this guy's lore that could have been a turning point to avoid so many people's endless torture? Well, I guess the past is the past. And this is Herman Carter's The Doctor Descent into Madness. It all begins in the small town of Michaelstown, Illinois in the 1970s. Herman was a very interesting child, and he possessed qualities that other parents would beg for in their children. Herman was very intelligent, an outside-of-the-box thinker, and very inquisitive. Everything around Herman that breathed, he wanted to learn about it, but this quickly turned into an obsessive motive. Just learning or reading about something was not enough for Herman. He wanted to physically or hands-on pull things apart and reconstruct them. At first it was technology and I'm sure this feeling led Herman to progress to more living endeavors. You would think that maybe it's all in the name of science. Brilliance cannot be impeded by feelings or morals. The bad thing is this was Herman at age 5 through 10. This is not the type of mentality you want a child thinking. To make such rash decisions and putting themselves in charge of other living things, it's not good. Regardless, Herman Carter continued his somewhat maniacal research into his high school years. This is when his teachers started noticing his near-perfect grades and well-written papers. Herman would then publish his own psychology magazine, Partisan. Herman became a star around his high school. Unfortunately, this never humbled him, and that obsessive personality started knocking at the door. And then, an opportunity arises. Herman, being the outstanding student with amazing grades, goddamn teacher's pet, is given quick access to a very prestigious school known as Yale, and he's assigned to Larry's Memorial Institute, along with other young scientific protégés. Something about Larry's building was curious to Herman. The smell of burnt flesh, and it felt very old. Nonetheless, he was interested. On Herman's first assignment, he already has a problem with the professor, Professor Blanchard. Dr. Blanchard, bleeding heart blank. He has no idea what real power is. Real power is freedom, true freedom. Freedom beyond the limits of ethics and morality. Oh yeah, those are some pretty creepy thoughts already. Dr. Blanchard gives Herman his first interrogation experiment, much to his delight. He could hardly contain his smile, of course. The experiment was simple. Herman was playing the bad doctor, another one of his classmates was playing the good doctor, and then seven other classmates were playing as prisoners, and the two leaders had to interrogate the prisoners to get passwords out of them. So Blanchard leaves the students alone so that they can begin the experiment and he is to return in seven days. So how are you going to get a password from one of these seven students? Well Herman is the bad doctor so he has more tools at his disposal, but according to him they are not effective at all. Bad doctor with a code. A list of do's and don'ts. Very limited. Too limited. So Herman tries a very animalistic approach. He tries to yell at the students. And of course, this doesn't work. Shout. Big deal. Tell me right. Shout again. It's all make-believe for me. I should smash this skull again. The secret word out of the substandard. 
Days and days pass, and the interrogation experiment is proving to be somewhat of a failure because the good doctor and the bad doctor have not gotten any of the passwords from the prisoners. And Herman, the bad doctor, is getting more and more frustrated at the good doctor. He's not liking his techniques, the way he talks to the prisoners. Herman thinks this guy is a little too soft. Little by little, the interrogation becomes more prevalent. They wouldn't let the prisoners sleep, they'd starve them and dehydrate them. Some basic functions of interrogation. And yet Herman was still sick of it all. He grew mad and lusted for brutal torture of the prisoners. It kept him up at night, knowing that those passwords were just a few shocks to the head away from being revealed. It made him lose his sanity. He would laugh at the images in his head, images of bloody teeth gouged out eyes, the victims being the prisoners. Herman knew interrogation was no place for morals. This darkness gripped him and he knew what he had to do. It was a normal day at the interrogation experiments. Prisoners just wouldn't cough up any answers and the good doctor was, well, playing the good doctor and talking to them. When the bad doctor enters the room, the energy in the room starts to shift and Herman beats his own classmate, the good doctor with a blunt object. Blood splatters everywhere. His fellow classmates gasp in fear. Brain matter was all over the face of a student that was just being interrogated by the good doctor. This was not pretend time. Interrogation ended and the torture began. He lets out a laugh. He loves this feeling, this feeling of control, this feeling of freedom. I wish I could tell you that the story ends there, but not for these prisoners. One by one, he ties them up, and their bodies become canvases for the doctor. He rips the flesh off of their faces in order to extract the passwords. They're all very afraid now. No more shouting matches. This is the real deal. And these were the passwords. New, Reich, Horizons, Fourth, Bird, and Kill. He got all of them by defiling his own classmates. So, experiment over, everyone go home, right? Well, the interrogation experiment was supposed to last a week, and it's only been about four or five days. You have the words. You win. We are done. We are done. Herman smiles. He knows he still has time to completely fuck up these prisoners' lives, but he notices something else. The good doctor is still alive, even after that horrendous beating. And oh man, the ideas that flowed through the mind of the bad doctor. You have to understand, Herman's biggest inspiration is Lord Cragg, a scientist from the 50s who was very demented himself and definitely had more freedom with his experiments. He notes that Lord Cragg put his own child in a box for years as an experiment. Lord Cragg also specialized in lobotomizing people basically means erasing their entire memory of themselves. And this was Herman's big idea. Herman would remother his fellow students, open up their heads, play around with their brains, and he forced his classmates to keep their eyes open as he looped disturbing and violent images and have them play different scenarios, have them play different people. And with the good doctor, he had a grand idea. Herman convinces the good doctor that the other students are actually Russian spies, and he is to kill them. This was of course to shift the entire blame of all this crazy torture away from the bad doctor so that he gets away scot-free. Herman was so in love with his experiments, and he was so smart, unfortunately, very manipulative, he wanted to control his entire fate so that when Professor Blanchard comes back to check on the experiments, it wasn't his fault. Very smart. The bad doctor hands the good doctor a spoon. This would be the killing weapon to be used against the other prisoners. Herman is somewhat amused by this. He'd never seen someone use a spoon to kill other people, but there it was. He successfully manipulated the good doctor into becoming the killer that Herman actually was. Job well done. And it's been seven days and the experiment week is over. And Herman knows his entire story. He's going to tell Professor Blanchard that the good doctor went psycho and killed the other prisoners. But Dr. Blanchard is not alone. He is joined with men in black suits, very formal looking suits. And the professor confronts the bad doctor, Herman, and the good doctor who's laying down on the floor with a spoon, bloodied spoon that is. Herman tells the professor the fake story. And Professor Blanchard says, 
We taped the whole thing. Much to Herman's surprise, he did not see this coming. Blanchard's men quickly arrest Herman Carter for good. Professor Blanchard approaches the good doctor, who is no longer himself. He isn't showing any signs of humanity, no emotion, no response, just staring straight into the floor with a bloodied up spoon. Blanchard is somewhat amused and he mutters something to himself in German. And then the professor gets up, looks at Herman in the eye and says, Looks like you had your chance to make Mary hell and took it. Herman was absolutely confused. I don't understand. Yes, you do. You understand much more than the others. The cuffs are just for appearances. Welcome to a key awakening. This is the complete enabling of an up-and-coming madman. This child genius with an amazing brain fell into the hands of a deeply disturbing experiment that enabled him to explore his violent urges. Larry's Memorial Institute was not a scholarly program. It was a secret black site facility. The men that arrived with Professor Blanchard were not cops, but CIA agents. And this entire experiment that killed seven students and completely damaged the life of the good doctor was more of a job interview for the sick, twisted mind of Herman Carter, who has now fully transformed into the doctor. And his reputation did not end there. He was now a fresh recruit of the Black Site facility for interrogation experiments. You know, they taped the whole debacle of the seven students being tortured through electricity. So the CIA knew that Herman had a fascination for electroconvulsive treatments, and his reign of terror only began there. Patients, prisoners, anyone that Larry's memorial found interest in was very afraid of the doctor. In fact, he was the most feared. None of these prisoners wanted to experience the bone-crushing shocks of the doctor's treatments. Hundreds went through that door, and they all disappeared. No one knew that this was actually a government facility. Very shady. Until one day, the doctor disappeared, and Larry's Memorial Institute was investigated because of the silence, and what they found was horrifying. Patients without brains, or no recollection of where they were, patients in vegetative states, sick surgeries, all in the name of science. Investigators reported their findings at Larry's Memorial Institute, and the government just shook their shoulders, erased all the evidence, and the Institute was closed down for good. And when you're playing on that map, the Larry's Institute was home to many prisoners and patients torment, all under the direction of Herman Carter, who truly, truly just wanted to be able to go into the brain and control everyone he could. That was his main goal. I wonder if he achieved this goal through his trials. Would he be pleased or would he just let out a laugh? <laughs> and so that was a pretty sick tale of how exactly the doctor was enabled to become the monster that he truly was destined to be. And huh. Sounds like a normal care. Sounds like a normal day for me. So yeah, that's how Midoriya came. That's who Midoriya sees. And let's just say Midoriya wishes he does, but like even he knew who the trapper was, and he fucking hates the idea of being working with this guy. But he keeps his mouth shut because he doesn't feel like dealing with him. The doctor doesn't really talk either, mostly because him and the trapper don't really get along. But he'll make an exception considering that he is doing well with them. So this is when the trap this is when immediately they open the portal. Well, and this is when the trapper comes out and the portal is separating other students. Now you're probably wondering, who is there? It just thirteen, that's it. It This is when the trapper and the doctor for immediately see Karashima, Dinky, and all that. Dinky starts using electricity on the doctor, which only just makes the doctor giggle, and all he says to Dinky is, FASCINATING! Izuku just chops off Dinky's head, and this one, and immediately the doctor says, NO! I wanted to experiment on 
And he just looks at the doctor. All right, all right. I guess you will do. Ugh. But Izuku knew the torment. He's been to the doctor's whereabouts. So he knows what would happen if the doctor got a hold of them. So he did it in his mind. Even God, I would know, is, is the one thing. He killed, he attacks the doctor. The doctor saw this coming. So they start fighting. And immediately Izuku start, starts gouging the eyes out, out of the doctor. And this is when he rips it off. The doctor's now just laughing thing hysterically. And Izuku just kicks off the doctor. The doctor pretty much lands in the water and starts electrocuting the water with the with the villains. And Izuku just thinking, what a sick, twisted bastard. Kirishima attempts to attack Izuku, but Izuku just grabs him by the neck and, and just snaps it. It not that nice of him? What? Why are you looking at me like that? What do you thought I was going to do? Oh, wait. You thought I was going to make them go through pain and suffering like that did. Hey, no, I'm not in the mood for people to die that quick and brutally. And besides, I would not do that for as someone on without a reason. Well, actually, that's why I would do that. But I'm saving the doctor what if for another day. Oh, boy. I wish I didn't say that. Don't get me wrong, the Doctor is cool and all, but I never play the Doctor in Dead by Daylight. I always play either the Trapper or the Une. Don't judge me. Yeah, don't fucking judge me, okay? I just prefer those two. Besides, the Doctor creeps me the fuck out. Oh, and you all can laugh all you want. You know I'm right. If you bumped into the Doctor, you immediately be... You shitting your pants. Don't even try to act all innocent. And I don't want to hear anything from you. Anyway, so Midoriya actually takes care of them and immediately they start sitting down. Um, he lets the other villains take him out, and the villains have been killing the heroes. Immediately, All Might managed to get there, and he just watches the fight. But he does a smart thing. He disappears. Ares, as soon as the Nomo is defeated. It, he knows those when to win a fight, and one is a lost fight. And all those heroes, he knows he's going to get his ass whooped. Midoriya managed to get back to the location, and... And this is when Midoriya sits down. Now, I'm taking off his mask and all that. But this is when he sees Aizawa just looking at him and just tapping his foot. Uh-oh. Hello, Trapper. Shit. Who is Trapper? I am Izuku Midoriya. Yeah, I've done the research. Izuko. Oh. Or is it Izuku Midoriya, which you said? Fuck. All right. He holds out his arms. What are you doing? Are you got? Are you gonna cuff me? What? No. What? You heard me? No. You haven't done any crimes yet. He simply gives him a look like, huh? The trapper did hit some shit. Well, why aren't you arresting me? Because I saw you kill the doctor. I think that's a crime. I could look away. Besides. If I arrest you, Shinzo would never forgive me. Okay, what's the real reason why you're not arresting me? Me? Because both of us are not so innocent as we should, as we see. Wait. I know you now. You're that guy who can I know you now. You're that bastard who kept sabotaging my bear traps. Back when the entity had us, yep. How did you manage to get out? Out. Dumb luck. Huh. You? Went through a portal. So, what about President Mike? Does he know? No. How about this? We keep the secret. Right, okay. You only kill bad heroes and... 
villains, villains and any other drug people, I'll keep looking the other way. Deal? Easy to think about it. Deal. Deal. Perfect. Now let's go eat something. Now don't take a shower. Shinzo's gonna be waiting for you. Okay. Anyway, pause break. <clears throat> Hello, I am back. Now, pretty much, this is when Midoriya just sits down. But this is when they get done with the usual hotel thing. And they've been doing, and you see, he's been doing what he promised over the past three months, been killing people. Oh. But this is when, in a couple of years, has passed. Izuku now and is uh, is now um, very old. Shinzo is now twenty, and this is when Izuku proposed marriage, and Izu and Shinzo happily agreed. Exile was was happy, but this is when Shinzo says, "By the way." I have one request for you. Yeah? No more killing. Eh, why not? This one always says, Yes! But he said that out loud. Whoops. You knew? Uh, we uh, both knew, actually. <laughs> uh, although I'll give you credit for hiding it. I didn't know you were the trapper until last month, so... Why didn't you report this? Because you've been killing corrupted heroes. I was reported, but you killed the doctor, so... You killed the doctor? Or, yeah, that psychopathic serial killer. Don't remind me. So, do I have your permission? As long as you don't impregnate him. He's a dude, how can I do that? Fair point. Wait. And that's about it. This has been the one shot of What Up Deco the Trapper. Like, comment, subscribe to the channel. This has been Dumbico Dylan here. And I will see you all in the next vid. Ow. I love Pop Tarts.